Thank you everyone for joining us today on our webinar to fine tune SAM2 on your own data. Uh, we are very excited about this one. Um, so maybe just to start off some quick introductions on our side. Uh, I'm Eric, one of the co-founders and CEO of Encore, and I'm pleased to be joined today by our ML solution lead, Alex Bonet. Alex is the local SAM expert here at Encore. Uh, he wrote the original blog post on how to fine tune the original segment anything model that's been read by over 60,000 people. He's been looking at SAM2 very closely in the last week since it was released, and will share a lot of the learnings that he and the team has had, uh, which we're very excited to um, showcase in this, this webinar. So maybe just going through the agenda for the webinar, uh, we'll go through a quick introduction and motivation of why do we care about SAM in the first place? We'll go through a short history of the segment anything model, um, then we'll present SAM v2, uh, especially in comparison to the original segment anything model. And we'll spend the bulk of the webinar going over some fine tuning strategies and how to actually evaluate fine tuning on SAM2. So the questions that you should have answered by the end of the webinar are, what is SAM2? Um, how does it compare to the original segment anything model? Uh, what are some strategies that and considerations for actually fine tuning SAM2? And does fine tuning SAM2 actually work in practice or not? Uh, so those are the things that we should uh, happily answer. But of course, if you have questions throughout the talk, please throw them in the chat and we'll save time for Q&A at the end. So maybe a quick sneak peek on the last bit of does fine tuning on SAM actually work? Well, we found some very promising early results in our initial experience of fine tuning SAM2 on specific data sets. And we, we see that it can actually be quite effective. And Alex will go into this in a lot more detail later in the webinar. But here is an example where on the left, we have uh, the original SAM2 uh, on a segmentation of body of water problem, and then a fine-tuned version, uh, which you see is uh, much better on getting the entire body of water, not being tricked by shadows or glimmers or, or things like that. And uh, these are the types of things which uh, can be quite effective in a lot of real use cases. So. We're very excited to jump into that, uh, but quickly, uh, who are we and uh, why do we care so much about uh, the segment entry model? So we're on Cord, we're a data development platform. Uh, we help AI teams automate data in a single workflow. So that includes managing and curating your data at scale, performing automated and manual annotations of that data, and then evaluating your model. So make sure that your model is getting the best data in and taking the low quality data out. And all of this is integrated into a single platform, a single workflow that uh, nicely works together. And we've been thinking about uh, Segment Anything model uh, quite a bit, um, basically since it came out the first version last year, because uh, we spent years thinking about how to properly automate the annotation process. And when the first Segment Anything model came out in April of last year, we you know, saw the demo by Meta, we read the paper, and we realized this is you know, a, a very powerful tool, and it can really help a lot of our customers with the the annotation side of things. So, you know, we needed, we wanted to get into the platform as quickly as possible. We spent the entire weekend working on it, integrating to the platform, testing and making sure that it worked, and then uh, made it available to customers the Monday after it was uh, released. And it got basically immediate usage, and the usage only picked up from there in the last year. So when SAM2 came out uh, last week, we were quite primed and we realized how valuable it's been for our customers in the last year. And we thought a uh, weekend is probably not enough. Uh, let's let's do it uh, faster than that. So we actually integrated into the platform in less than 24 hours and made it available to customers. And we spent the last year really diving deep into the model and trying to understand it in different use cases, things like fine tuning. And the point of this webinar is to share some of the insights we've had um, in the week that so excited to go over today. All right, so uh, the title of the webinar is Fine Tuning SAM2 on Your Own Data. So it's always good to understand the vocab words of the title of the web webinar before we go too deep into the webinar. So what, um, what is SAM2? Um, what is Segment Anything Model? Uh, so Segment Anything Model 2 is a state-of-the-art foundation model. It's for vi image and video segmentation. Uh, it was trained on a very large data set. It's the successor to uh, the segment anything model, which we were calling SAM v1, 
which only worked on image segmentation. And fine tuning is the process of uh, modifying a base model to work on a specific uh, domain of data. So these foundation models are trained on very large, very diverse data sets. They're quite general. Uh, but sometimes you are happy to trade that generalizability uh, to make it work uh, more performantly on a specific subset of data. If that's the specific part of the distribution that you care about, um, you're happy to, um, you know, to fine tune it such that it forgets other parts of the distribution. And this is the use case that we're going to go, go into today of how to properly fine tune SAM on a specific set of data. And some of the use cases for this uh, are things like um, making uh, the segmentation model work on things like geospatial imagery or medical imagery. These are things that we've seen in the last year or so since we uh, released the first version of the segment anything model. Uh, but also allows you, it gives you more control over uh, model attributes and characteristics. So things like uh, the speed of the model, the accuracy of the model, um, you can tune the, the resolution, which resolutions it works on, things like that. So fine tuning can be a quite useful resources uh, in, in this case. But before you fine tune any model, uh, the first thing you should just do is check if the base model actually works for your problem in the first place. So uh, the key rule of data science and AI is benchmark, benchmark, benchmark. So uh, we'll go into how to properly fine tune and all the details are around them, the valuation. Uh, but you should ask yourself uh, before you do any kind of fine tuning or even research and fine tuning, uh, does it just work out of the box as is? Uh, so we'll go into uh, some of those bits in a, in, in, a, uh, in a bit later in the webinar. So first, a short history of the segment anything model. Uh, Sam V1, uh, so segment anything, it was released April of last year uh, by Meta. And it's used a number of use cases, oftentimes interactive segmentation tasks, automated uh, mass generation, uh, makes it very, very convenient for things like uh, automated annotation or an annotation workflows. And it, as, as I mentioned before, it only works on images, but it's often paired with segmentation tracking models um, so that you can get it to work on video. And the way that it works in our platform is we pair uh, the segment anything model with uh, the QD model, which is a segmentation tracking model. And we let segment anything do the initial segmentation of an image. And then we allow QD prop to propagate that segmentation forward across multiple frames. And since we've introduced the segment anything model, so this was back in April, we've seen it used uh, literally millions of times on the platform, which is why we were so excited when SAM2 came out uh, and we really jumped on the opportunity to integrate it very, very quickly into our system. All right, so there are two key innovations. This is a bit of my opinion now uh, that uh, Segment Anything had. Um, and uh, again, my opinion, I think these were partially inspired by OpenAI and ChatGPT. And the uh, first innovation is just thinking about scale. So uh, what OpenAI showed the world is that you can just throw a lot of data at a model and if you do that and you make it work at scale, the model can uh, start to produce very impressive results. And I think this is probably an inspiration for Meta um, to start thinking about how to train a segmentation model at scale um, at a bigger scale than any other segmentation model uh, up until that point in history. But the difference between uh, an LLM uh, like ChatGPT and a segmentation model is that segmentation models, they require uh, ground truth annotations uh, versus being uh, working in this autoregressive self-supervised way that LLMs do. And to generate the scale of that number of, of annotations, uh, you can't just throw um, humans at the problem. Uh, just be, You could, but it would be very expensive and it would take quite a long time. So the innovation that Meta actually had was to build uh, what's called a data engine within their system where they use the model in the loop uh, to do some automated annotations, send those annotations to humans to correct and refine and review, uh, retrain the model to get it more refined, have that generate more annotations, and then so forth and so on uh, in this loop. And if you do that correctly, then you can actually get a lot of ground truth done uh, much cheaper and much faster than if you just do everything in a manual way. And with this approach, they were able to create billions of masks, which uh, or over a billion masks, which they trained the model on and which uh, gave it its uh, its power, its generalizability, and it, its performance. 
So this approach of a data engine, it's something that uh, we are particularly uh, biased to uh, at Encore because that's uh, what our system is. Uh, it uses uh, this, the same principle. That's how we work with customers of um, taking data, selecting the right data, uh, using the model in the loop to automate the annotation, sending just what needs to be sent to people, using that in a refined iterative uh, iterative fashion. So this data engine approach, I think is one of the, probably the most important key innovation that Meta had for this model. But the other approach, uh, the other innovation, uh, I think also probably partially inspired by uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT is uh, what I call prompt inclusive architecture. So we've seen plenty of segmentation models where you know they take an image encoding and then they use that encoding, encoding to create segmentations. Uh, but what's interesting about SAM is that it also takes a prompt in the form of a, a point or uh, a bounding box or another segmentation mass, and they condition on that prompt to uh, create a, a more uh, accurate mask in a particular image. And the effective encoding of the prompt and incorporation of the prompt makes the model very, very use of, uh, useful, especially for annotation pro uh, projects. So this prompt inclusive architecture and scale is really what makes segment anything what it is, uh, at least in, uh, in my humble and personal opinion. All right, so everything we've been talking about up until now has been, has been about um, the segment anything model, what we're calling SAM v1. So let's get into SAM v2, the new thing that came out last week. And the main difference by far of SAM2 versus SAM1 is that it works on video data and it can be used for segmentation tracking. And this is potentially a game changer for any kind of uh, video segmentation use case. Uh, I, I can see that it can be extremely useful in uh, automating annotation for uh, for video segmentation tracking. So that's uh, the, the number one difference between SAM2 and the, the original segment anything model. The model architecture is quite similar, and we'll get to that, uh, how it's differed in a second. But what we saw with SAM2 is that Meta really doubled down on this idea of the data engine. And they used the initial version of SAM now, which was quite good and, and, and uh, trained to a high degree. And they use that as one of the core components of their data engine to then propagate that into video. And with that, they were able to create the biggest video segmentation data set in history. It was 50 times bigger than uh, the next largest, uh, largest data set. And then trained on that huge data set uh, to make a more performant, more accurate uh, model that's also faster than the original segment anything model. So going into the architecture, uh, the main difference between the uh, segment uh, SAM2 and SAM1 is the addition of these memory components. So the memory attention and uh, memory encoder. And that allows the model to take not only the uh, current image encoding and current prompt, but also uh, prompts and encodings from adjacent frames as well. And to um, it, uh, create mass uh, on images where you might actually not even have a prompt in the first place. So it can use prompts from uh, previously in the video uh, to create segment uh, segmentations on, on new images. And this addition of memory is what allows the SAM2 model to actually work properly for video use cases. The, the main other difference between uh, the initial architecture was they swapped out the image encoder uh, into a new hierarchical encoder that runs faster um, and makes SAM2 uh, in general just much faster than uh, than the original segment anything model, which also makes it palatable for video use cases because if it's too slow, uh, it's not going to work on a video that has uh, many frames per second. So those are the main two differences and they manifest in more accuracy and uh, faster uh, model in general. So let's go and see a demo of what this looks like. And uh, this is uh, Meta's actual actual demo that they released. So they prompt the model on, um, on the shoes in the beginning and it automatically propagates across the video um, pretty effectively. And what's interesting about um, this workflow is that you can dynamically adjust the prompts uh, over, over different frames. You can adjust them with uh, positive and negative prompts. And uh, as you, you know, continuously iterate, uh, you can improve the, uh, the segmentation across the video uh, in an interactive way. So this is in contrast to uh, segmentation tracking models like Qt, 
where you you propagate the segmentation once, and then if it gets off, you have to delete uh, the next set of segmentations and repropagate it. Uh, you can see how this workflow can be very, very useful, especially for uh, annotation tasks. So that's a little bit about SAM2 and how it differs from SAM1, but uh, I'll pass it over to Alex now to go over how good actually is SAM2. So we've mentioned a few things, accuracy, performance, um, but Alex has really dived in deep and uh, will share some of his insights here. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. So um, the team has been uh, investigating SAM2, inspecting it, uh, you know, in every sort of angle that we might possibly imagine uh, since its release. Um, we'll show some of those pieces of analysis in a second, and we'll also show it uh, live in the platform. But before that, um, just wanted to ground some of the context that we've already laid down around the sort of performance and UX of using a video native model rather than uh, a sort of chained approach. So you can see here, this is taken out of the um, SAM V2 paper. And on the vertical axis, you can see we have a measure of performance, the quality of the masks that are being produced. And uh, along the horizontal axis, you can see the number of frames um, that have been annotated with uh, a certain number of clicks. Now at the bottom, you see um, SAM2 and segmentation tracking models, which Eric mentioned previously. So for example, QT. Um, and the main sort of issue with these, as we've already mentioned, is the fact that we can't update the prompts after having generated the initial mask. So the workflow is often prompt the model, get a mask, track it, go forwards in time. And if you find any issues with the predicted segmentation, you have to either edit it, delete what came after, retrack, or maybe you might sort of have to start from scratch all over again and then generate a mask and retrack. And it can be quite cumbersome and time consuming, especially when we're talking about creating these kinds of high quality masks at scale. So one thing which is very important for this interactive workflow is speed, right? So you saw in the Meta demo that I showed earlier, um, one hosted by, by Meta, um, it's extremely quick, right? So it can run uh, close to uh, sort of native FPS uh, of a video. So in terms of experience, right, you are unlikely to be able to watch the video faster than its native FPS. So anything that kind of approaches, matches, or exceeds the native uh, frames per second of a video is going to give you a, a very real time experience. However, what's important to note when you actually want to use these models is that they have various kind of flags and settings that we might need to, uh, you know, properly understand and take into account when uh, deploying the model. So a few kind of axes here, uh, one being the model size. So uh, as is common with most foundation models um, that provide the, uh, the, the model weights, um, we have different sizes of architecture that we can use. So you can see here, you go from tiny to large. Uh, and that really affects the speed and throughput of the model. And when you're considering your use case, um, this is something definitely to, to benchmark and test, not just in terms of speed, but also in terms of quality of masks, right? There's no point using the extra large model if you're segmenting simple things, let's say, you know, you're just segmenting very regular objects that are also uh, sort of natural objects, right? So things like footballs, let's say. Um, that's not something that we necessarily need to invoke the large model for and invoke that uh, and incur that performance penalty. There are also, uh, as I mentioned, those model settings. So things like compiling the model, um, running it on more expensive hardware, which is not really a model setting, but more of a deployment choice. Um, and then other pieces that uh, SAM v2 allows us to, to turn on or off. So things like being able to work in, in a batch mode, right? We can process multiple things at the same time um, using things like flash attention or uh, floating point operations. So this was uh, benchmarked on a uh, Tesla T4. And you can see that throwing kind of better hardware at the problem immediately uh, gives us a performance boost, as well as turning on some of these more um, uh, sort of advanced optimizations, which uh, are not available on less performance uh, hardware. You can see here, we're not approaching the, the, the real time piece here in this particular benchmark, because we haven't turned on some of these other optimizations as well. Now, one thing which is really interesting to dig into is the handling of resolution. So you can see on the left-hand side here, we have the image scale. And uh, anything above 1024 gets downscaled by SAM. So it'll take the image, it'll downscale it, it'll process that downscaled image, generate some masks, and then upscale those masks. And the, you know, the issue that can occur with that is if you have very high resolution assets with very fine uh, detailed objects that you're trying to segment, uh, you're likely to obtain kind of poor performance, right? Which we'll see in a second. And you can see as well, we, we do incur a, 
speed penalty as well, especially when going uh, between these last two rows. Now, with quite a minor code tweak, we were able to, to test this. You can actually process these high resolution assets natively inside SAM v2. So you can see here on the left, uh, 1024, 1024 input on this surfer. And on the right, a high resolution input that hasn't been downscaled. So we've modified the, uh, the, the actual model code in order to, uh, to make this run at native resolution. And the difference is to note here from a qualitative perspective uh, that on the downscaled mask, you can see that, for example, the region between the uh, bottom arm of the surfer and the body of the surfer is filled with mask, right? That mask that's been predicted um, as being a, a region that's part of the surfer. Now that's occurring because of that downscaling uh, sort of upscaling piece, right? Where uh, the masks are then being blown out and these areas are being, uh, being filled in. But if we treat this asset at its native resolution, we can see that works slightly better on these edges. We get a, a tighter mask, but overall the surfer is actually kind of not properly segmented, right? Something's gone a little bit wrong here. And the reason for that is uh, the model is not designed to work in this way. And so we see our surfer here dreaming of, of fine tuning, right? This is actually a, a really good opportunity to think about fine tuning a model where we've changed the way that it's going to work. Um, the, you know, the training model is not conditioned on, on these kinds of assets, um, but we can, you know, modify it, have it work on these assets, fine tune it with high resolution imagery, uh, and then hopefully expect better results uh, on these kinds of assets. Now that's something that's very important um, to be able to do, especially if we're thinking about you know, dealing with either very fine features in very high resolution assets. We've seen approaches like cropping, for example, um, where you may try and segment an object inside a high resolution asset, have a crop generated around the object you're trying to segment and feed that in at its native resolution. But then the problem becomes, what if that object, say in a video, leaves that crop? Um, and what happens if uh, if the object actually you know goes outside the crop, even in a it's still a frame, right? That crop might not be big enough to account for the entire object. Great. So um, this is uh, Sam uh, V1 versus V2 on uh, in this case, images, really a frame in a video, um, and we can see some of the speed up pieces there, where the V2 model here uh, very quickly gives us the prediction for the car. So as soon as we've released that bounding box prompt, excuse me, as soon as we've uh, released that bounding box prompt, uh, we get a, a mask being generated, whereas for the V2 model it takes quite a bit longer. And we can see how this would scale up to uh, video style assets as well. And this performance penalty becomes more and more important, but regardless of that, SAM V1 can't actually work with uh, videos natively. We have actually seen some approaches with SAM V1 uh, where people will, for example, run an object detection and tracking model and then use that as a prompt into SAM V1 and do that frame by frame. Um, but again, doesn't allow for that iterative prompt refinement workflow um, that we saw in, in that method. And we can also um, use this for video tracking. So you can see here, I've got SAM V2 on this car and I can just track it. So previously we would do this by chaining the QT model, but in this case, we can actually use the native SAM V2 uh, model and also uh, take into account that whole prompt refinement workflow that we saw with the uh, meta demo previously. Great. So now we can actually go in to the, uh, to the fine tuning methodology uh, piece. So we'll be looking at a couple of things. Um, we'll be looking at the uh, kind of data engine workflow and also uh, digging into some of the model architecture specifics that allow us to perform fine tuning. So reminding back to that earlier slide that Eric presented, um, we like to kind of use our own tooling um, because it's the tooling that our customers use to either train models from scratch or fine tune models in their infrastructure. Um, and we like to use our own tooling in order to, to power this as well, because it's the sort of most efficient and best way to, to go about things. So we cover a lot of uh, different sections of the uh, annotation pipeline. Um, the two kind of key ones that we focus on today are the curation and model evaluation piece. Um, Eric you know, talked about the automation of the data enrichment and generation process, right? So that automated or semi-automated annotation angle. But in this case, uh, we'll just focus on these, uh, these two sub-components of our platform. Great, so the goal of the fine tuning problem that we're um, solving today is to produce better masks with only one click, right? So we want to save on clicks. Now, uh, the example shown at the start, right, with that link um, would 
be segmented properly by SAM v2 if we add more and more prompts, right, to try and include the whole link. But that's something that takes more time um, and is tricky to work with, right? Ideally, we're looking at some assets, we pop in a point, the whole thing gets segmented. We might even have um, some rougher model that we want to use as a, as a prompt generator upstream of that. And we want to make sure that SAM v2 is going to work without additional uh, prompts uh, in order to generate that mask. Now, the example we're going to use is on imagery. Uh, we're going to use a nice Kaggle data set. Um, and we'll produce better masks here. But as we'll see later, actually, the fine tuning approach that we take uh, also allows us to improve video segmentation quality as well. So the sort of rough steps are A, to analyze the SAM v2 architecture, which uh, Eric has already presented to us, but we'll uh, recap in this section. Selecting a data set, curating that data set and the ground truth uh, masks that are present. So in our case, we're not showing the enrichment part of our platform. We're just taking uh, you know, existing labels that we're going to use to fine tune on. Spin up a collab notebook. We're going to generate prompts to simulate user input. Um, you could also take different approaches here. If you have uh, you know, existing user inputs and you want to mimic a specific workflow, that would also be something to, to consider there. And then finally, run the fine-tuning process and again, use our own uh, infrastructure to evaluate the fine-tuned version of SAM. So many, many data sets are available to us um, that you know, uh, across different domains that are domains that SAM has, has likely not seen. You can see in the top left, this football uh, data set. Now, I think thought this would be something that would look quite nice. But we immediately discarded it because the data present in this data set is likely something that SAM v2 has already seen, right? It's probably quite close to uh, the type of data that it's been trained on uh, looking at the data set that was uh, you know, used by, by Meta. I have a few other interesting ones, medical specific um, assets in that brain tumor segmentation piece, obviously a, a very important field um, and slightly niche applications like let's say uh, cloud segmentation. We picked the uh, drone data set here um, because geospatial imagery is, is quite unique. Um, typically uh, the, you know, the, the angle, the resolution uh, of the images tends to be quite different from what's available in, uh, you know, out in the wild data sets. So this would be something that's interesting to show you. So um, the first step in the uh, by tuning pipeline is to understand our data, right? Because if we just try and curate, uh, sorry, we just try and fine tune a model on everything, right? There might be bad quality data, there might be irrelevant data that's outside the problem space that we're trying to solve. And we definitely don't want to, to just go into this uh, blindly. So you can see um, this is a, the typical sort of collab notebook approach. Um, you know, we downloaded our assets, we're visualizing them. Uh, we see this actually uh, a lot of customers and prospective customers that come to us are operating inside Jupyter Notebooks. They've got scripts lying around. They visualize things manually. It's not a repeatable process. Um, and this is not something that we can really use properly at scale. What we prefer is to use uh, you know, an enterprise grade uh, data visualization tooling to start to explore the data set, slice and dice it, um, and decide what it is that we want to send uh, through our fine tuning pipeline. So switching over to the uh, visualization piece, and I think you can, you can see my screen here, I've switched off the, the slides. Um, we can actually go in and start to explore our data set. Now we'll explore the drone segmentation data set in a second. But the one thing that I wanted to point out is that often um, we have you know, customers come to us with tens of millions, hundreds of millions of assets, um, and they sort of look like this, right? They just, they're in a S3 bucket, they're unstructured, and they're hard to explore. The view that customers typically prefer to have when they come to Oncord is this sort of view, right? So a nice searchable structured data set that we can apply filters to, which we'll do so in a second, um, to narrow down on the uh, pieces that are of interest in their data set. This is uh, just for illustration purposes. It's actually a uh, data set that we used last year for the SAM v1 fine tuning on uh, marine life examples. And you can see here, we've got several million assets. So switching over to our Kaggle data set, um, you can see here that we're in the uh, data part of this uh, side of the platform. So this is typically where customers will kind of start to explore their data. And we've got a couple of terms that we'll go come back to as we start to fine tune the model to see what it is that we've done and whether it's actually any good. So one piece that just to mention here is on the raw data exploration, customers will typically want to start to find uh, relevant parts of the data set, right? So things like similarity search, say, okay, great, find me more assets that look like this one, right? Because I found something that's niche and that's of interest. We actually don't really need to, to do this in this example because we already have labels. So we want to jump in 
the labels tab and start to analyze uh, the labels that are present in uh, this data set. So again, Kaggle data set downloaded with the masks applied. Uh, you can see here we have uh, these red areas, which are the very high quality masks that we're going to use to do the fine tuning. You can see here they overlay bodies of water. So the problem we're going to solve is fine tuning SAMV2 to segment bodies of water with only one prompt uh, as accurately as possible. Now, immediately, and again, depending on the data set size, different approaches uh, might be more or less relevant. So typically, uh, customers with large data sets will use the embeddings view to start to understand how their data is clustered. On this smaller data set, not necessarily as relevant. But one thing that is relevant is removing assets that are not going to be of, of use to us. And you can see here that we have a few swimming pools that have crept in. And these swimming pools actually have no water in them, right? Despite being labeled uh, as having water. And this is something that's very common with public data sets that we are found on the internet that are inevitably part of the training pipeline for any model, not just fine tuning, but any kind of model application. Um, you know, if we're scraping data off the internet, we're using collated uh, data sets that may vary in quality. Uh, we don't necessarily, we know what's in them. And if we don't have a structured approach to both visualizing these, but also later on setting up automated uh, curation and QA pipelines, we might end up just having junk in our system, which is not uh, a very good look. So I don't particularly like these swimming pools here. Um, so I'm going to do a similar search on the labeled asset. So this is just searching on the actual segmented region. And I'm going to start tagging them. So you can see here, I've got all my swimming pools. I've got at least a few of them. And I'm going to, going to tag them as being pools. You can say, these are my pools. I'm not really interested in them. Now, I'm not quite sure yet here if I've, captured all the swimming pools in the data set. Um, but I can go in and, and start to understand how, let's say, my data is distributed. And I have a hunch that these are actually um, highly bright areas because most of the lakes that we have in here are, are quite dark areas. And we can see here that if I filter by my pools, you can see here they're all kind of distributed in this, this high brightness region here. So using this hypothesis, I'm going to narrow down on this area of the data set and you can see that, lo and behold, I found essentially all of the, the pools in the data set. So what I'm going to do is select all these, pop them into that collection. And again, typically in production, we'd automate this. But because this is a uh, you know, webinar, I've got to show something uh, visually pleasing. Um, and you can see we've grown our pools collection here. But how can we be sure that we've captured all the swimming pools? What we're going to do is we're going to filter down by our swimming pools, find a reference one, and perform a similarity search, and then exclude our swimming pools. So here, if I search across my data set, I rank everything in terms of its similarity to this pool, and then I exclude the ones that I've already tagged. So you can see all these are already tagged as pool, which is what we did in the last step. I can go ahead and exclude them. And you can see that the closest assets here are, are, not, uh, are not pools, right? And so the ones with the uh, highest similarity ranking to my base image are not swimming pools. So we're not going to use those. We've successfully discarded them. What I've done, and we won't sort of uh, dive too deep into this, um, but I've set up a, a preset uh, in order to uh, in order to find and uh, bring in lake assets into my collection of bodies of water. So you can see here, I have a bodies of water filter, um, which is essentially auto filtering my data set. And typically as we grow data sets and we bring in more data, um, we'll want to stream these into the right groups. So yeah, just to recap on this piece, it allows us to work at scale programmatically and have collaboration between technical and non-technical users, right? It's great that ML engineers can do this in code um, and they can with uh, with this kind of platform, but typically that it will exclude, you know, data operations members, product managers, people who are very close to the problem space that's being solved. Great. So switching back to the presentation side of things. Uh, Eric gave us a, a, an overview of the architecture of SAM v2. Now, for the purposes of this uh, fine tuning example, we're going to fine tune a specific part of the model. So these models typically have you know, millions, billions of parameters. And one thing to fine tune on the whole model is something that is going to be slow. It's going to be expensive. So it'll take a lot of time. You'll need very good hardware. Um, you need to run it for a long time. and um, you're probably not going to converge to a good result 
uh, in as stable a fashion as targeting a specific part of the architecture. And the part that we've decided to fine tune here is the mask decoder. Now, what we want to do when we're actually going to implement our training loop is to say, I'm going to set the gradients to false for everything else because we don't want that to come into play in our optimization routine, but we're going to target the mask decoder. And the reason why this is a good piece of the architecture to target is that it's quite lightweight. So it doesn't have that many parameters in comparison to the rest of the model. So we can kind of work with this efficiently and quickly. And it's quite core, right? Even in this diagram, it's in the middle, right? Uh, it's predicting our, our masks. Um, and it will also allow us to work with, uh, to generalize this fine-tuned model to videos. Because, of course, you know, we can, we could fine-tune other parts of the model, right? You can see here the, the memory encoder, et cetera. We could decide to, to fine-tune these. But fundamentally, these downstream parts of the model, which then create this loop that allows us to work with video, are working on the masks. So if we have higher quality masks, then we should be able to uh, should be able to uh, to get better quality segmentations for videos. Key to understand as well is for imagery when you use SAMV2 for images, uh, these two pieces are basically not doing anything, right? Because we're just going through uh, going through parts. Great. So um, in terms of uh, your fine tuning, and we won't go into all of the technical details here, um, but just highlight a few examples. Um, and you know, very keen as well for any conversations after this. Webinar, if anyone has specific questions, you want to kind of see the code in more detail, want to understand if, if we can help you do it, um, then love to, to jump on a call. Um, but you can see here, we, we set up our, our data loader, kind of key to any, any ML process. Um, and the only main thing to point out here is that we randomly generate prompts. So given these masks, given these, uh, these, these images, what would be the prompt that someone would provide to uh, trigger a segmentation? Now we could also decide to do this from a video, sorry, from a bounding box perspective. It's another type of prompt that uh, Sam V2 takes. Uh, but in this case, we're just looking at randomly generated prompts because chances are a user that wants to fine tune, uh, sorry, to segment something is going to click inside the thing that they want to segment, and they expect the point that they've provided to be part of the mask. So it's a relatively good approach. We could go in and say we're going to make prompts that are only close to the center or that mimic specific user interaction. But in this case, this is, uh, this is what we want to show. So for the uh, example, um, we take the tiny version of uh, the model and we decide that we're going to, uh, we're going to fine tune it. Now put it into, into training mode. Uh, and we of course set the relevant parts of the model to be, uh, to be trained or, or, or static. And we think about what our training loop would look like. Now, this is taken from the um, excellent uh, notebook provided by uh, Meta that shows you how to use uh, SAM v2. And generally, the flow for SAM v2 is actually very simple in order to, to use it just in, in the case of an example, not thinking about the optimizations and you know, various other pieces that we might bring into play, but just you know, on, a, on a test example, you essentially call two methods. You set the image so you can embed it, and then you call this predict method. Now, this would be trivial to do if all we had to do was take the predict method, wrap it in training loop, and, and be done with things. But when you actually look into the uh, source code of these models, we can see here um, that they are decorated with this uh, no grad piece, which means that they uh, are not sort of going to be something we can just take and just put into our uh, fine tuning loop uh, in, a, uh, in a sort of very straightforward way. Now, the key to any fine tuning process, and of course, generally any model training process is to properly understand the data flow, because that also allows us to understand which parts of the architecture we might want to uh, fine tune. Great. So before we run the master decoder step, we need to prepare these, these prompts, right, that are being provided and encode the input. Um, one thing that's as well very important to note in these models and can sometimes trip people up when they get started is that they expect tensors of all kind of different shapes, sizes, downscaled, upscaled. And so it's important to not get anything wrong because typically the first kind of step you get if you just try and do it um, you know, very quickly and simply is something will complain that a tensor has the wrong size and is going into the wrong part of the model. So it's just very important to, uh, to you know, ground ourselves, understand the architecture and uh, target the relevant pieces. Uh, yeah, the worst case scenario actually is that uh, nothing complains and you don't get a, a nice crash, but actually uh, you get a you get a sort of silent failure, right? The prompt was actually encoded to be outside of the region you're interested in or something was upscaled incorrectly. Great, so we actually run the fine tuning process, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, you can see here, uh, resizing a few things to calculate the loss. And 
we get a nice uh, a nice uh, kind of convergence. So the main thing to note here is that you know this is done on a quite small data set, but has some complexity, right? We're trying to, to really increase the quality of the masks that are being created. Um, and this was you know, done over a small number of epochs. It ran on pretty cheap hardware and took around sort of 20-ish minutes from start to finish. So it's something that can be done uh, for many projects, right? You don't need to wait until you have 10,000 very high quality masks before you think about doing a fine tuning process, right? The ideal approach is to say, I've used SAMV2 on 100 examples, let me fine tune it. And then when I can use it on my next hundred examples, I can save, you know, 30% of my time uh, that's not being wasted uh, improving the quality of these masks through manual uh, interactions. Great. So Alex, maybe just going through how long, how long did it take for Epic um, that you were finding in this, in this use case? Yeah, these were sort of in the in the range of sort of minute. They were they're very short. Um, again, I mean the data set size is, is not huge, right? So uh, so it's going to be pretty quick. Um, but yeah, overall sort of in the, in that sort of uh, probably a bit less, around sort of thirty seconds. Um, yeah, it's pretty pretty quick. So everything that we'll see is um, fine tuned in less than an hour. From yes, your, from I think that would have been a great title for this webinar: <laughs> fine tuned Sam in, in less than an hour. Um, but yes, so we can we can name the next one there. Great, curious to see the results. Great, so how do we actually um, evaluate the quality of the masks that we've generated? Um, so just as a reminder, on this kind of one uh, one prompt problem, you can see here, for then a Sam here, and that fine tune less than an hour piece on the right. So, you know, again, if we're trying to generate a lot of these labels or chain this with another model, we really want to be able to, to have, you know, the right-hand side result rather than the left-hand side result. And going even deeper into niche applications with very specific data that's not publicly available, this becomes even more powerful. Now, we'll show this as a static image and then we can actually go and do some exploration. Um, what we did is we ran both models on our test set um, and compared the, the results. So this is a, a 0.8 IOU. So looking at um, you know how much do the, the, the models overlap? Uh, sorry, do the, the, the predicted masks and the ground truths overlap? And you see quite a you know stark improvement in performance uh, between the two. One thing that can also uh, be interesting to do would be to uh, evaluate this, let's say, over multiple prompts. So in this case, we just evaluated over one randomly generated prompt and had both models generate a mask. So it's quite a fair test, um, but we might want to evaluate this across you know, four or five prompts per mask or per image that generates a mask and then do that sort of comparison. But here we're just showing this, this first order of comparison. So the fine tuning in, in less than an hour increased the map score by 64% for the fine tuned version versus the, the standard. That is correct. Fantastic. So um, we can actually go in and do some evaluation here. So let me just clear a few of these things. And we can go into the evaluation piece. So I'm going to take my uh, base model and my fine tuned mask model, increase this a little bit. And you can see there, we've got some, some differences in, in performance. Again, depends on the, the thresholds that we set. Um, one thing that's interesting to kind of go into is here we can see our, our precision recall curve right between the, the two models. Um, this is a single class problem, right? So we, we're not decomposing it by class. Um, but you can see here, we've got SAM V2 here uh, doing a lot better than the, uh, than the V1 model. We can also go into lots of lots more analysis in terms of what are factors driving the lack of performance, right? So maybe it could be that uh, the uh, SAMV2 performs better on uh, you know images with low contrast, right? And if we want to then fine tune for that, we'd go back into the selection piece, find assets that have that characteristics, and feed them to our model. Now in this case, because of a small data set, we could just do a quite a simple split. Uh, but on larger data sets, this is relevant because you don't want to run the fine tuning process on a hundred thousand assets. It's going to take a lot of time and be very expensive. Um, and have you know marginal uh, gains. So you want to select your data appropriately, work as efficiently and quickly as possible. Now, going into the predictions explorer, we can actually start to understand the types of uh, errors that the, the models are making. So you can see here, um, this is the SAM V2 original masks. And we can see a few of these examples. So some of these uh, cases it's doing well in. So you can see here the prediction overlaid on top of the ground truth. So if I just hide my prediction, hide my ground truth, that's my ground truth, and that's my prediction. So it's doing pretty well on some of these examples. Um, but there are also examples where it's not doing so well. So for example, uh, let's say this sort of windy, uh, I think there's a bit of wind going on in this uh, in this image. 
you can see here that the prediction here missed out the uh missed out the the sort of shaded area or the area with the ripples whereas those were present in uh in the ground truth so this is something that we would you know we'd rather have the whole thing segmented if we use sam v2 we'd have to click and then click again and maybe sort of click again right to include uh, more of the area but because that user experience is so important that's something that we want to optimize for we can filter down see all of our uh, false positives here. So you can see here all the uh, incorrect detections of uh, SAM B2 or the incorrect mask predictions. Uh, if we switch then to the, uh, and let me just note down one of these. So let's say uh, the one we were looking at previously. So this one, let me just note down its ID. So this is 103. Um, if we switch to the uh, switch to the fine tune masks, we can see we've still you know, made a few errors. So for example here, so here we're including this area that we're not interested in. This is decking, not water, um, but far fewer false positives. And if we then also filter down by the specific assets where we saw that, uh, that error class. So I just go in here. You can see that with the fine-tuned masks here, we're covering uh, a lot more uh, of the of the lake in, in one shot. So we can see the drivers of performance here, which are going to be Maybe we show it more data, more relevant data, train at a larger scale, um, train for longer, et cetera. Uh, and we're going to be able to use this in order to uh, in order to create uh, high quality masks on the rest of our data set using a much more efficient, much higher quality uh, model. We'll also be able to use this, let's say we had you know drones flying over things, uh, having it generate better initial masks and then react better to uh, prompt adjustments later in the video are going to be uh, is going to be a, a big booster. Excellent. Um, very interesting seeing those results, especially from uh, very few images that were being uh, were being fine tuned and from a very short training process. So, just to summarize, uh, what we've learned today is uh, how to fine tune a very, very state of the art um, model. Uh, in you know, we, we've been doing this just a week after it was released, and we found that it can actually um, improve on specific data quite effectively. Of course, uh, what made it easy for us is that uh, we had access to good enterprise-grade tooling for the curation, the management, and the, the evaluation of the model very quickly. And if you're thinking about doing fine-tuning or training yourself, this will be quite useful uh, for you to make sure that it's it's easy to do. And you can just think about uh, the model and the data and not all of the other components that are associated with it. And working with uh, a platform that integrates the latest state-of-the-art models allows you to get all of the benefits of that quite quickly. So um, thank you everyone for joining. And uh, I see there's a ton of questions in the chat. I've been trying to uh, answer them as, as they come, um, but please send us an email uh, if you want to talk to us about SAM2, uh, want to talk about how to use the, the platform in conjunction with SAM2. And we do want to go over some of the, um, the questions uh, that we got before the, the, the chat and also some of the questions that are still in the chat, which are maybe best um, suited for Alex to answer. Uh, so we'll start with the, um, the, the questions that were sent beforehand, and then we can go through a few uh, questions that are lingering in the chat as well, um, time permitting. So maybe starting, does Encord provide fine-tuned SAM 2? Alex, I think you're on uh, mute. I'm on mute. Um, yes, yes, uh, yes. We provide some V2 as as uh, we said, we provide the vanilla model in the platform. Uh, but for fine tuning, that's also something that we can kind of support for for specific use cases. Um, and then loading obviously the the custom weights um, for your deployment, right? So for your your space, and you can use a fine tuned version of uh, of the model. Uh, and again, all those examples that you mentioned at the start, those uh, are not just things we you know magicked up. They're actually representative of parts of our customer base. So I think it's going to be quite exciting. Uh, seeing that in the platform. Excellent. Can SAM be used to refine existing seg uh, semantic segmentation results? Yes. So uh, as you mentioned a bit of earlier, uh, we can feed these in uh, as you know, sort of the model and uh, have it work uh, to refine these. So uh, we can we can definitely use SAM B2 to, to build on existing bases. And can I train SAM to recognize damaged objects in very diverse situations, sizes and angles for a manufacturing quality project with few training images. So it's a very specific question, but what do you think, uh, uh, Alex? 
so yes, um, the only thing I would I would call out there is around the very diverse situations, right? So when you fine tune, as you mentioned earlier, Eric, you do trade off that generalizability, right? So if you know you you have a specific color of car that you're fine tuning on in specific lighting settings, and you just fine tune on that, it's not a well balanced data set. Let's say or you don't have one, and then you want to apply that to other um, examples. It's probably not going to work very well, and it may actually work slightly worse than the vanilla Sandy two model because you've traded off that generalizability. So, got two things there. One, you can fine tune on more diverse data, but again, that can kind of weaken the point of fine tuning because fine tuning is not over, you know it's not overtraining, but kind of right. We're really we're losing some of the properties of the model, um, or you can fine tune kind of different versions of the model for different use cases, right? So different night and day and uh, colors of vehicle and scratches versus dents that sort of thing um so one, one to put in there and the reason why that's still very useful is that you can still identify high level characteristics about these assets before sending them for, for enrichment right so you can say i'm going to stream ones that look like they have a dent into a you know a, a zone that has one specific version of the model that's going to be the first one people use and others with a, another preference right so it's something that you can you can already kind of guard against great uh, so I wanted to aggregate um, several questions which have the same theme in the chat, which is they're all along the lines of uh, fine-tuning SAM with multiple classes. Um, so, of course, an example that we went through, uh, there was a single class, so we're trying to fine-tune on a body of water. Um, but how would you think about incorporating uh, different classes as well into this, this process? Sure. Um, so yes, yeah, so, I mean that's a very just a very specific example that we we picked. We don't actually have like bodies of water as a, a main like customer base. It's just a just a generic example. Um, but yeah, I mean, just essentially making sure that you have high quality, very high quality segmentation masks to fine tune on. Right. If you have kind of bad quality masks to start on, they're not very accurate. Then you're just going to be fine tuning to produce more of the same, and that might not be very high quality stuff. Um, so yeah, the only other piece to mention there is slightly, I guess, related to this car question that was presented, but also the question you just asked is it's not just always a one size fits all approach, right? So we fine tune the mask decoder. Um, maybe, you know, we want to fine tune the image encoding part of the, uh, part of the model as well, uh, or instead, right? Because maybe there are specific features that we need to extract that were just not present uh, and not being picked up properly, right? So if, you fine tune the mask decoder, it's trying to predict a mask based off an image encoding. But if that image encoding doesn't capture the features, and if you actually look at the full fine tuning code or you look at um, you know, the source code, there's actually a line that says features you know, equals and high level features and low, low resolution uh, features that it extracts. Um, if they're not there, then you're not going to be able to predict anything, no matter how hard you try and fine tune the mask decoder. So you need to be a little bit sort of uh, smart and case sensitive about it. Yeah, maybe just to add to that, uh, SAM and SAM2 are agnostic to the class of the object. So they, uh, it, the model itself does not give information about what type of object it is. Um, so if you have a task of you want to not only segment the object, but understand what it is, uh, SAM is actually, it might not be the best solution just by itself. Uh, you probably need to pair that with um, with some other uh, other model as well. But the advantage of that is that you can fine tune in a similar way that as we described today on um, quite diverse data sets with many different types of objects. So one of the, the questions was on a water mask and also a solar panel. You can just add the refined masks of both solar panels and water masks together, and the model will get uniformly better on those types of objects, even though it won't know the distinction necessarily between the two. Um, so another uh, set of questions uh, that again, we've gotten uh, is uh, thinking about um, running SAM on videos and fine tuning SAM on videos. Uh, do you have any thoughts or insight into uh, what that looks like? Sure. So that's something that is possible to, to do. I think the there's two things. One, as I mentioned earlier, fine tuning the uh, fine tuning on images still should give you a boost on, on videos. Now we haven't shown that today and we haven't shown the evaluation of that. That's actually probably for a, a follow-up um, follow webinar. Um, but uh, but yes, yeah, so you know, creating being able to create better masks through fine tuning on images will most likely lead to better performance on videos. And the second piece is, if you wanna fine tune on videos, you have to think about how you're gonna produce those high quality ground truth masks. Because uh, if, you're going to have to use a combination of SAM QT or SAM on every single uh, frame or SAM V2, 
as well, which could be used. But again, if it's not performing well, it's probably not going to give you good masks to then train on. So it's going to be quite laborious. Um, so you're kind of in this triangle of if I can use the automated, semi-automated tooling to generate high quality masks, why do I need to fine tune it? And it's not working well, so I can't produce high quality data, so I can't fine tune it, right? So uh, specifically video multiplies that data generation problem by quite a lot, right? 30 FPS, one second video, that's 30 images to annotate. So scale that up, takes a long time. Great. And so there are still quite a lot of questions, but um, I think we can wrap it up maybe on the last one, which should uh, uh, be the, the question to answer all the rest of the questions is, uh, are you sharing the notebooks and uh, is this going to be um, available? So if you want to uh, get access to any of the code or go through any of the, the, the procedures or have question, additional questions, please contact us after the webinar and we're happy to chat about uh, different use cases. I see that there's many, many different use cases that people are thinking about uh, via the chat, um, which we probably won't have time given the remaining uh, time left in the webinar, but we're very happy to um, chat with everyone and understand like what use cases are and how SAM2 and how fine tuning SAM2 can be useful for those types of use cases. So maybe just to um, to wrap, wrap things up, um, we do have another webinar coming up uh, in a few weeks. Uh, this is about curating data at scale. I think it's going to be very, very interesting as well. And we'll touch on uh, some of the themes that we discussed earlier in this webinar, and also thinking about um, how to create this kind of data engine for yourself. Uh, again, using the methodology that Meta actually used to create the SAM model in the first place. So please um, scan the, the QR code and um, uh, join us for the next webinar. But thank you everyone for, for joining today. Um, we're still in the very early days of SAM, uh, SAM2. So um, there's, there's still much more to discover and we're very curious to hear your questions uh, after the webinar as well and to talk to as many of you as possible. But otherwise, have a great rest of the day and thank you for joining us today. And thanks to Alex uh, for all the work on um, fine tuning SAM2. Uh, thanks everyone. Have a good one.